Well, welcome everyone to the final uh, PSA and BISA joint webinar on teaching politics online. My name is Donna Smith from the Open University and I'm co-chair of the PSA Teaching and Learning Network. Um, we thought it was a good time to reflect on best practice in uh, teaching online as it's you know, very likely that many of us will, will do a lot more of it in the future, um, either in response to the pandemic or because teaching and learning models and student needs change over time. So this particular webinar series focuses on module design and production, looking ahead to autumn teaching, um, building on the previous seminar series um, organised by each organisation. Today's session is called Running an Online Seminar Tutorial in Politics and IR by Andy O'Kane and Dave Lewis from the Open University. And the session will explore how to encourage student participation in online seminars and tutorials, what to avoid and what to expect. So we're due to finish in about an hour's time and there will be time for questions at the end. Um, I'll be moderating the chat box, so do post your questions there. And Jamie Roberts from the PSA is also on hand in case we have any kind of technical issues. So do put anything in the chat box um, if you have any concerns or problems. Please note the session's recorded and make sure you're muted for now. And without further ado, please welcome Andy and Dave. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Donna. Hi, everybody. Hi, um, my name's Andy O'Kane. And my name's David Lewis. Uh, we're both, uh, well, we've both been uh, associate lecturers at the Open University for a, a long time now. Um, and I'm very uh, grateful to Donna for introducing us in, in context of saying best practice. What I would say is certainly practice rather than best practice, but we've been doing it a long time. And me and Dave were quite early adopters in the politics team uh, in making use of the online tools. Um, really, we don't want to... Uh, push things too far today what we're, what we're really looking at is um, this idea of student participation in, in politics and IR tutorials um, and we're also thinking about what you should really expect what you should um, plan for I suppose when, when you're uh, asked to deliver a tutorial or, or a seminar in that subject or those subjects so I've got an agenda but the first thing I'm going to do is throw it back to the audience. Um, so hopefully this will work. Um, Donna's going to watch the chat box for me, but I've got a question for you. Um, and it's this, what is an online seminar slash tutorial for in politics and IR? I've put a, a slash between the two. There are uh, semantic differences, but they're often used interchangeably those terms. So why do we have them? I'll give people time to respond. Donna, is it working? Yep, I'm now about to put my answer, so we'll see. Yep, it's working for me. So really, this is a kind of first principles approach. Um, often gets overlooked, but what is, you know, we, we, we're tasked with delivering these things, but why? What, what is the purpose of it? I've we've, got lot, we've got lots of people saying about getting students to engage, discussion, application, clarification, um, interaction, exploring themes and concepts in depth, helping students form opinions about lecture content, giving students a chance to engage with, on the topic with other people as well. Okay, so there's loads of ideas there. I'm picking out some important ideas, but one is somebody's mentioned the idea of a of, of building on lecture or perhaps other reading material sort of in an interactive way. Um, helping was, was another word. Dave, did you pick out any more that stuck in your mind? Yeah, there? there's the um, allowing students to test their ideas and to develop their thinking through experiment and feedback. Uh, and, and I agree, I think that's absolutely key. That's certainly something, isn't it, that we expect from a face-to-face -face tutorial. Um, but I think as we're going to discuss, we found that that could be quite challenging uh, when we come onto the online situation. Uh, we don't think it's impossible, but we just think we might need to adapt some of our strategies. Right, so that's that's the main kind of theme, is that online presents particular challenges and hurdles to this kind of an interactivity that we might take more for granted in a, in a kind of face-to-face -face scenario. Um, not that it's always easy face-to-face -to, -face to get people interacting <laughs> even when they're in the same room as you, but in, in an online scenario it's more challenging. You have to be I think you have to plan more carefully in a sense to, to get that interaction built in. Um, so the first section of today's um, presentation is going to be uh, with me and I'm going to be going over the experience of some of the tutors who, who work in the politics team at the Open University. So we've got quite a, a big body of tutors working online 
uh, around about 25 tutors uh, working across the country um, with students studying from level one to level three um, in politics. Um, and a couple of years ago, well, about a year and a half ago, I, I did a survey because we're obviously trying to develop these things uh, constantly. I did a survey and asked tutors for their own experiences delivering politics and IR uh, in an online situation. You know, what is it like? What problems do they have? Uh, what's working for them? Uh, and so I'll go, I'll share some of the results of, of that uh, survey with you, which will, which will unpick as, as we go along and kind of identify some of the areas that, that, that might be most important. Uh, and then Dave's going to go through uh, some ideas for encouraging student participation in politics and IR um, online tutorials. And then we'll have a Q&A section at the end. So let's get stuck in. Um, so my section really is thinking about what's it actually like delivering it? So I'm guessing when I was tasked with this by Donna, um, she kind of prepared me in a way to say that, you know, there's a rush <laughs> online. Um, there are tutors from uh, traditional universities who may not have delivered online tutorials before uh, and are looking uh, to really uh, go into this in a big way next year. But also there will be lots of you who've also uh, developed and uh, delivered online tutorials. So hopefully there will be something in it for all of you. Um, we've planned it that way. Um, what I did a couple of years ago was, was to ask the tutors in, in, in our group what, what it was like, what are your experiences of teaching uh, politics online? Um, and we got some quite interesting quotes back. So here's one to start off with. Um, it's been satisfactory for me because I've not tackled anything moderately ambitious. This is not me, by the way. This is a tutor who shall remain nameless, e.g. such as breakout rooms. So depending on the kind of online environment you have, you may have the opportunity to break students into smaller groups where they can um, discuss things amongst themselves and then come back to a main room. Um, now, when you're studying how to deliver online tutorials, this is often put forward as a, as a great idea. Some tutors avoid this like the plague. Um, unfortunate choice of term at the moment. Um, another view, online tutorials are a necessary evil. Large groups of passive students who listen in expecting tips for the graded assignments. So this is a purely objective approach from the students who are coming to uh, really just be told how to answer the questions that they're being set. A kind of cynical view. Um, generally works well, but still a problem with students pretending their mic doesn't work. Okay, well, we'll come on to that a bit more a bit later. Um, some issues that come to mind are interaction with students is varied. Some tutors do not seem to be egalitarian in their use of a joint tutor. Right, so this is about working with other tutors. So sometimes our tutors might be tasked to work in pairs. Uh, and this tutor is particularly upset that perhaps uh, people aren't pulling their weight, uh, as well as not being aware of practical issues such as breathing into the mic, which can make the session quite disruptive. Students normally choose not to speak and overuse the chat box. I hope nobody's overusing the chat box today, which minimizes the interaction. So a tutor there with a view of the chat box as being somehow an inferior uh, method of interaction than using the mic a question, uh, uh, something we might question. Right, another thing to bear in mind, I think this happens to a, to a lot of our tutors, is that um, the training was fine, the training's great, and I'm sure that all of the institutions are providing this at the moment, um, but you find you might have to relearn it by the time you come to deliver your sessions. So I think the training is great, but make sure you kind of practice before you deliver your sessions. I think that's a, a key. Uh, piece of advice. So what I've got here is, is, is a series of charts um, really just telling you what you might expect from students who are taking part in the tutorial. Um, roughly about 15 tutors got back to me on this so the answers you're seeing represent you know eight tutors is about half of the cohort uh, responding that most of the students will take part using the chat box. Um, very, very few students taking part using the mic. Um, a few take part using the chat box for seven tutors. A few take part using the mic. So that's the kind of general experience. It seems to be that if you're expecting every student to use a microphone and if you're planning for that, that might not be the best strategy. Um, a couple of tutors having real problems, hardly anybody taking part, but 
thankfully nobody saying that no one takes part. Um, a more in-depth kind of drill down into this mic question. So I think particularly with um, an online tutorial, when interaction is, is being sought, the idea of the mic and it seems to be the obvious way of, of pursuing uh, that discussion or that interaction. Uh, but as before, only a few use mics uh, with a few not using, with a, a couple of tutors saying nobody's using them. Now, there is a reason why I didn't even ask about use, the use of video uh, in our tutorials. We do have video facilities in our um, tutorial rooms, but up until this year, I think it's fair to say, Dave, that it was relatively unused by students. Was, would that be your experience? Yeah, and it's kind of relatively unused by tutors as well, to be honest. Right. It's possible that things have changed because of the, you know, the advent of Zoom and, you know, the, the, the whole culture change that's happened in the last few months. People are now kind of more comfortable in taking part in these huge kind of online video type um, events. So that may be something that changes. And I think the fact that people are being videoed might make people more uh, open to taking part. I mean, Dave, one of the things we've talked about quite a lot uh, in preparation for this is the, is, is the, the cost and benefit of taking part in an online tutorial for students. And yeah, I know that's, that's something right. that you're going to talk about a bit later, but it's, but it's relevant to this, isn't it, I think? I mean, if, if just pop in, um, I mentioned it here now, I mean, I think there's a very different costs and benefits from participating online as compared to face to face. So in face to face, if you're not participating, you have to live that you're performing it, you know, it's really embarrassing. Everyone's you feel like everyone's looking at you. There's a real pressure to say something um, to show you're not completely ignorant online. That doesn't exist, at least when there's not the video, um, you know, you can sit back. There may be just a gray icon and you can hide behind that. And, um, you know, often as, often as well, students, um, it's very difficult to know whether they're actually engaging at all or whether, for example, they're scanning through social media. I mean, I had one experience of a session I was on recently where a guy left his microphone on and he was playing saxophone um, through, through the tutorial. <laughs> so there's a, there's a very different, um, as I said, costs and benefits. Uh, and so I think that we need to take that in very much into account and um, not rely upon people engaging in the traditional sense of discussion so so we have to think about different strategies for getting students to to uh, discuss or to communicate their ideas and to construct their understanding collectively now i think it's fair to say that um there are some tutors who are able to get students really engaging with the mics uh so we we asked about tips to encourage microphone participation and got a few interesting responses uh, this tutor says, I try to provide instructions at the start for students to check their audio and then arrive a few minutes early to try and create an opportunity at the start to use it as an informal chat in the hope that it will carry over. I think that's a good strategy. It certainly works for me. Um, you know, if you want to discuss kind of current affairs or something before a tutorial or something that's even re relevant to the tutorial um, before it starts. I think this is uh, a key way of getting students to 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 respond, asking questions, even kind of straightforward out and out, you know, please use the mic to respond questions can sometimes work. Um, using icebreakers, using provocative slides. Um, no, they all claim the mic doesn't work, says one tutor, I left that in for amusement value. Um, I tend to include other interactive activities that engage students and get them thinking rather than rely on the microphone use, which is patchy. So this tutor's kind of learned from experience that really um, there are, he's better off pursuing or she um, other, other strategies. Another strategy is to ask students to elaborate on a point made by the student in the text box or the chat box for the benefit of others. That does tend to work as well, actually. Um, final one I'm not so sure about, emphasize the importance of using the mic. Um, might work, I suppose. I thought this would be quite useful for people to see what kind of things are being um, used. Um, obviously the uh, PowerPoint is the most common um, teaching tool being used in politics uh, at our institution. Uh, 
followed closely by chat. Now, one of the things we do have access to in our teaching environment is polls, but if you don't have access to any software that allows you to do that, you can build them into the PowerPoint. That's certainly, um, I've found, you know, multiple choice polls uh, allow students a way into the discussion because they've ha they're having to engage creatively and actively with an idea in order to produce an answer. Uh, and once they've committed to that, they're more likely to be able to volunteer to respond and explain their decisions, the choices they've made. Um, so whether you have poll software or not doesn't really matter. The idea of a poll, the idea of a multiple choice question, it's quite a good um, technique. And I know, I know Dave, you've, you use that quite a lot. Yeah, I do. I mean, you, you can build whole exercises around polls. So for example, you know, if you're talking about um, voting behavior, I mean, you can talk about you can use a poll in order to illustrate the problems of Condorcet paradox, for example. So you can actually build a whole exercise around the polling experience. And as Andy says, you know, often when people um, vote on a particular question and they've expressed their preference, if they find themselves in a minority position, they quite often they, they want to justify uh, the, their, their preference. So in that way, you can quite often get them engaging with the microphone. So it's, it's a, often a good leaping point into a deeper discussion. And there are other things you might want to uh, experiment with, such as links to, to websites or videos or other things that, that you might be able to do in the particular online environment that you're in. I think they, they tend to have diminishing returns. They can, often students report, uh, some of them are able to view the things that they're being asked to view and others aren't, and it can kind of create a, a, a break in the experience because you're, you're, in a sense, your focus is taken, taken up by trying to get the thing to work rather than actually delivering the, the teaching material. So in a sense, certainly early on in your uh, use of this type of, uh, in, in your, early on in your use of online tutorials, I think, you know, play it safe is, is probably the best advice to start off with and build these uh, more, more elaborate things in later on. But one thing that is really successful for us is the use of the whiteboard. So we have access to a, an environment where students can kind of write their responses on a, on a, on, on a kind of blank uh, web environment in an interactive way. And Dave's going to give an example of that a bit later, but that's a really good tool if you have access to that. Um, it does sometimes require you to kind of train the students a bit in how to use that or just to remind them about what um, uh, how that happens and how it works but it's, it's usually quite straightforward. I mean if I could just jump in there on the whiteboard I did a quick uh, YouTube search this afternoon looking at you know different software um, which you can use, utilize as a whiteboard and and there's a vast array of, of options available and I th even believe that Zoom has a whiteboard option somehow. I'm a bit of a Zoom noob so I would don't know how to use that but I, I think there's plenty of options out there for people. Okay. So this breaks down this kind of activities that people are using into more detail. Um, most people are, as I said are using the PowerPoint lectures a big chunk of people are using breakout rooms and I think that can be a nice way of kind of giving students that opportunity to, to, to test their ideas with other students which is I think a key part of the, the seminar tutorial experience but you do need to kind of develop that kind of um, confidence in using breakout rooms I think. Um, discussion type activities based on prompts um, I think that's a, a good idea and then we've talked about multiple choice quizzes and polls already. Um, I think that might be a repeated slide. Right, another big one. <laughs> Do you ask students to prepare for tutorials in any way? So I, I certainly remember when I was working at a, 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 a brick university, we, in seminars, we would um, closely link the seminar slash tutorial program to the lecture program that somebody mentioned that earlier. Uh, and with that, there would be some required reading or other um, preparation to take uh, take place beforehand and I always remember particularly when I was new to this uh, being surprised by the number of people that didn't take part in that or hadn't prepared in that way and certain and kind of learned I suppose to teach in a different way which was to kind of think what do I do if if people haven't prepared um, it's a bit different for a different institutions I suppose but I think delivering an online tutorial you, you need you do need to think about whether students need to have a certain um, preparation before they come. This is the response of our tutors. Um, I prefer to encourage students to come rather than make them feel they can't, shouldn't, if they're not up to date with the reading, haven't done what was asked, etc. Um, 
another tutor sends out a word or a PowerPoint plan in advance of face-to-face -face tutorials and online tutorials slash sometimes. <laughs> I say what we will be covering so students know what to look at beforehand. I think it's entirely reasonable to expect students to, expect students to have done some preparatory reading. I ask students to read relevant chapters of the text and come prepared to ask questions or to offer thoughts. So you can see there's some very different um, responses, but several said no. And divided opinion as to whether this is something that we should um, expect from students uh, coming to the tutorials. Can, can I just add something there regarding yeah. preparation? I mean, my experience has been, if, if you assume that they're going to prepare then, especially an online tutorial uh, and if you're recording it, it it's going to fall flat on its face either it won't work at all or it will become dominated by the one or two you have i mean this happens at face to face as well but it's it, it's particularly a problem with online um and i think it's possible to design learning activities which the students can participate in and thereby construct an understanding without actually having any prior knowledge uh, or without having prior reading um, so that's the way I tend to go is I just expect they haven't done the reading um, but I still think we can have positive learning outcomes. One of the things that's been a kind of um, bugbear and you may have no influence on this whatsoever um, but it does make a difference when planning activities I think which is the, the, the nature of the group size that you're dealing with. Um, certainly with um, smaller groups it's more possible to develop a kind of more informal use of the microphones I think. Uh, when you're dealing with groups above 50 um, the chat box can become quite um, complex and certainly some of the experiences we've had over the last couple of years particularly since Brexit and since um, the Scottish independence referendum chat boxes in, in, in certain politics subjects often become <laughs> um, many kind of fights for some for certain students and I think that the bigger the, si the size of the group the more uh, difficult that can be. So one of the strategies we have certainly where we work is, is to have a couple of tutors uh, in, in, in an online tutorial, one to watch the chat box and to moderate it, you know, if anything untoward happens. Another uh, technique we've developed is to have some ground rules uh, that everybody agrees to beforehand um, regarding um, what's to be said and what's to be written not without you know not saying you can't say certain things but the way that things are said and I think particularly in an online environment where you know there's that kind of lack of, of facial kind of interaction people don't know how things are intended when they're written and they can look more kind of strong than perhaps that the, that the intended meaning was so group size is something to bear in mind particularly if you're running a large session on your own it can become more difficult I think I think this is a constant so our tutors have been being trained for the last at least the last five years uh, and it doesn't go away that need for training um, the kind of preference for face-to-face -face or this kind of idea that face-to-face -face is somehow superior to online is is still there it's the traditional kind of idea um, I've talked about using breakout rooms this is one that me and Dave are particularly interested in. More sharing ideas of what has worked for others is always helpful. Hopefully this is what today is about a bit. Certainly will be more a bit later. Um, and that's something we would encourage you to do. It might be that you don't have a huge politics cohort within your university, but if you have other tutors in similar subjects, sharing ideas is, is a great way of doing it. Um, but uh, I'm sure that uh, the PSA and um, BISA also, uh, possible avenues for that. That idea about simplified um, training, um, knowing what the key kind of tools are, the, the absolute must-haves that you need to, to run a particular session. Um, again, this idea of subject-related interactive tutorials, um, training, breakout rooms come along. Okay, so this is about to lead into the next section. Um, if anything comes through for, from our experience over the last few years, it's been that the best sessions, the one where you walk away feeling that you've, you've done something or achieved something as a tutor, are the ones where people have interacted, where students have participated, and you feel good about that. Um, and I think that that's 
the kind of consensus of, of, of everybody in the room when they came earlier is that that's what they want a, a tutorial to be. Um, so here's a, a nice insight from one of our tutors. He said, with the lack of student microphone engagement, it makes it very difficult to be as student led as the face to face tutorials. Often students arrive saying that their microphones do not work, hence activities designed to encourage microphone use can fall flat as everyone pretends they have a hardware issue. This often forces us into the old boring lecture mode or having to try to make conversations work by reading out responses from the chat box. Polls do help, but these can only be used a couple of times. So that kind of poor experience that the tutor's having when people don't use their microphones and it's not been planned to have a different approach. Ideally, we should be able to use online tutorials to enable students to discuss ideas, but the problem always seems to come down to the basic issue of encouraging students to participate. Perhaps students should be offered more training as well. If students get more confident with the technology, then this is likely to encourage them to participate. This is something we don't think about enough, I think, as, as institutions, which is we expect the tutors to be trained, but perhaps we should also think about um, training students. And this is something that, particularly at level one, um, I've spent a lot of time doing in, in, in early sessions on early sessions in the in the year, really kind of getting students confident in using the tools or knowing what to expect from an online tutorial. Right, I will hand over to you, Dave, for your um, session. Sure, and, and just leading on from from what Andy said, I I almost wonder whether there's kind of a, a bias within our sector where we we tend to think about what the teacher is going to be doing rather than what the students are going to be doing. And this is reflected in, in, in the fact that, you know, we're not providing students with training um, on online sessions. Um, and my, my experience with, with online teaching, for I think for the first couple of years um, when I was trying to get it to work, um, I, I felt that Hubert Dreyfus, he, he was basically, he, his argument was that online teaching is it, not effective, it doesn't work. And the reason is because you don't have that depth of um, experience that you have in a face-to-face. -face. There's not all the um, uh, psychological cues. There's, there's not, you can't build up the depth of a relationship with the teacher to get any kind of dialectic going. And I must say, you know, to a certain extent, I think he's right, especially when there's, you know, people not using the microphones, etc. So I think he's right, but I don't think that's the last word. Uh, what really impressed me was, was uh, Jacques Rancière, um, an ignorant schoolmaster when he's talking about the role of a teacher being not to impart knowledge onto onto passive students but um, rather as a facilitator to enable the students to come to their own understanding of particular problems and um, that's kind of the way I've been trying to approach the the activities and the sessions which which I design. Could I have the next slide please Andy. So a th approach which I found really effective uh, and my colleagues at the OU is, is to be learner focused, to think less about what we're doing as teachers and more what about the, the learner the student is going to be doing during the session. And problem solving can be uh, really useful here. So the idea is that you design an activity which is centered on a problem which the students have got to solve. And this, this gets them in, tends to get them engaged, okay, especially if it's an interesting, exciting problem um, they have to come up with a solution to it and and so they're not sitting there being passive perhaps scrolling through social media they're actually having to think about the problem having to think about their um, their learning what they've learned so far on the module and apply that to the problem um, and what we've what we found is that this kind of active experience it, the learning experience is, is more engaging than than you know lectures online lectures um, and also quite often it, it encourages it encourages a discussion, but it's also a practice which isn't reliant upon discussion because as we found, you know, when we've been relying on discussion, it often falls flat. So what this has meant is, is that we've had um, discussions at the OU about utilizing tools and, and, t and learning strategies which are um, not verbal centric. Uh, so it's things like manipulating images, uh, moving things around on whiteboards. Um, I'll, I'll provide an example shortly. Okay Andy, next slide please. 
Now, something that I've personally found really useful is, is Little John and Pegler's LG Light planning tool, which you can find in the, in the preparing for blended e-learning. Now, this wasn't um, designed just for online learning, it was de designed for blended environment. So where online learning supplements face to face. But I found it incredibly useful for designing online learning activities. Um, basically, the whole idea of the planning tool is, is you use it to, to plan, document, and you can share your blended online online learning activities. What I found really, really useful about this, this tool is that it's learning centered approach. So it's thinking, you know, what, what are the learners doing during this activity? Uh, another really useful aspect of, about it is that it enables us to share activities. So you can build a number of different activities, um, which you can also um, share with colleagues who, who or maybe graduate teaching assistants or whoever who are teaching the particular module online. Uh, they can use those same activities in subsequent years or, you know, you could even use the same activities in other modules, or other courses. Uh, so the whole tool is designed to be able to share an activity. It's got uh, three elements. There's a learning pattern, an activity plan, which is essentially a lesson plan, and a learning sequence map, which is, which is concerned with the resources you're going to need for that session. Myself, I don't use a learning sequence map particularly often. Um, it can be quite a lengthy process. I tend to use the learning pattern and, and the lesson plan. I think the learning sequence map really comes into its own when you're sharing that activity with others. Um, so let's have a look at the tool. Next slide, please, Andy. So this is the learning pattern. And essentially what it is, it's, it's identifying a learning problem. Uh, which can be related to, for example, you know, one of your course learning objectives. So, excuse me, I'll just mute my microphone, I take some water. So, I, I've pulled this from um, one of the sessions that I teach on, on um, one of our modules, and uh, it's a section on political ideologies. And a particular problem that I found um, that I wanted to design a learning activity to help us overcome was uh, um, regarding Michael Frieden's approach to the analysis of ideologies because I felt that often students at, specifically at level two were finding it difficult to really understand and get to grips with with Frieden's approach to ideology. So what I thought I'd do was get them students to collaborate online to construct a, um, a diagram, a map using Frieden's ideas of the structure of a particular ideology. So the aim I had was to foster, for the students to foster, to develop a working familiarity with, with Frieden's approach and to get them actually engaged in, in uh, analysing an ideology, thinking about an ideology. Some of the learning objectives I felt this would, would provide was an engagement with his ideas, um, but also as they were participating in trying to map a particular ideology, um, any disagreements about the elements of that ideology would, would illustrate the contested nature of ideologies. And, and it may also aid reflection, uh, meta-reflection amongst the students upon the very idea of political ideology as an analytical ca uh, category. And is there more water? It's... Okay, Andy, next slide, please. Now, this is the activity, the plan, the lesson plan. Um, so basically, you, you break down your activity into, into key um, sections, um, key stages. And the idea is, um, you can see it's divided up into times. The mode is um, the, the method of, um, of communication or method of teaching, you're the kind of tools and resources you're going to be drawing upon. So you can see them. the first section, which is 10 minutes, is going to be online webinar with microphone and online slides. Now this is what I find particularly useful is that you, uh, you break down the tutor role and the student role. So this forces you to think about what the students are going to be doing rather than just what you're going to be doing. And for me, this completely changed how I teach. Um, so here, the tutor is going to introduce Frieden's approach to political ideologies and the analysis of ideologies, and then walk them through an example of how we might map the elements of an ideology. Now, during this, this section of the learning activity, the student's role is essentially passive. You know, they're listening to the presentation and they may ask questions for clarification. 
So uh, what resources am I going to be using here? Well, there's going to be a slide presentation, freedom's theory, and also a slide presentation of an example, uh, which is going to be communist ideology. Now the feedback, what feedback are the students going to be receiving here? Well, here it's kind of minimal. It may be uh, replies to the student questions. Now the, the second part is, is the more student focused aspect. It's the, it's the heart of the exercise. Now this is going to be using the online webinar again. Now uh, it's get, this time it's going to be using a web, um, sorry, a whiteboard, um, also text chat, possibly microphones and we could use polling as well if there's any disagreements. Um, what the tutor would be doing, they would introduce and facilitate the activity. Um, they would facilitate any polling if required and they would summarize the activity in the end. You know, what have we learned from this session? The students role here is to work together to, to construct a map of liberal ideology on the whiteboard. So what are the, what are the elements of liberal ideology? Now, there's gonna be diff differences of opinion um, I certainly found this every single year there's differences of opinion and this often leads to debate and discussion um, always in the chat box but quite often as well on, on the microphones if there are any irre irreconcilable disagreements then we basically put it to a poll um, so what resources are required for this well there's a pre-prepared whiteboard basically you have the whiteboard and you just draw blank blocks on it as you'll see and then the students fill these blocks in with with words they can move them around they can manipulate the objects using whiteboard tools um, now what feedback are the students getting during this exercise well they're engaging with a discussion with the peers they're debating their own preferences uh, what they think are the key elements to, to liberal ideology and the, the differing importance of those elements there's also polling and there's also the tutor summary at the end Okay, next slide, please, Andy. Now, this is a sequence map. This is, as I say, this is really useful if you're going to be sharing the activity or if you're building a, like a, a resource library of different activities to be used in different tutorials or across different courses. Um, so basically, just, just let the, the person who's going to be using a learning activity which they haven't designed, it just lets them know uh, what they need to have um, and again, what the different tasks are and, and the kind of elements that are gonna support the exercise. Okay. Next well, and it, it basically walks them through, it, it, it walks you through the, the activity. So, the, you know, the resources, the tasks and the supports at each stage. Okay, next slide please, Andy. So here's the example of, of, of the, the activity. Um, this activity, it doesn't take up the whole tutorial. It, it's one of three in this particular session. Uh, so the idea is that you have you have these little blocks of activities which you can fit together within an overarching structure um, and you know provide some scaffolding for their learning. And the idea is that uh, the, this structure of these learning activities will lead the students through to obtaining the learning objectives, which is your aim. If we could have the next slide, please, Andy. So here, basically, this is um, a slide which uh, I would present to the students, and it basically presents Frieden's, uh, you know, the, the, the key elements of Frieden's, Frieden's um, analysis of ideologies. So you can see ideologies have a kernel composed of core definitions of ideas, um, such as freedom, equality, or liberty. Then there's the adjacent ideas, which are related to the core ideas, and there's peripheral ideas or peripheral elements that provide further context. And then on the next slide, I provide an example for the students. So here's an example of communism. So core ideas, adja um, adjacent ideas and peripheral ideas, okay? Now the important thing to stress to the student is that this is not the right answer. This is one person's reading of a particular ideology. But here I, I am basically demonstrating uh, what they're gonna be required to do in the next exercise, which if we can move on to please, Andy. So this is basically the instructions to the students. So they've been presented with um, an overview of Frieden's approach. They've been presented with an, uh, an example of the application of that approach. And here is um, instructions for the exercise. And it says, next you'll see on the whiteboard a blank structure composed of boxes, core, adjacent, and peripheral. Work together to construct a map of liberal ideology. 
Use the whiteboard tools to write in the boxes and you can also move the boxes around as you please. Now I request that they start by discussing the core idea and then work out the adjacent and peripheral ideas. And if there's any disagreements which we can't resolve through discussion, we'll put it to a poll. And as you see, I say, please feel free to use your microphones. Okay, next slide, Andy. Now, this is, um, this is what I would present on the whiteboard. The students are able to type in these boxes and they're also able to, to move the boxes around. Um, so, you know, you can use this in a breakout room or I found it to be most successful actually when you have quite a large number of students. And um, they they're just type they're just type in. You quite often get students trying to type in at the same time, and then they have to justify uh, their preferences, their their decisions in the chat box. Of course, you have to facilitate this, so you have to be looking carefully at what, what's going on and saying, "Okay, I can see two people have got differing interpretations of of the core idea." So let's discuss this. And through this way, you you the students would be actively. Um, using Frieden's approach, they'll be getting a better understanding of, of Frieden's approach to ideologies, they'll be constructing their own understanding through their own experience, and they will also be getting a better understanding of, of the ideologies. Okay, and next slide please Andy. Um, now this kind of approach I, I try to use for, for a great deal of, of, of you know, many, many of, of my, the different exercises I have. It's, I always have the same kind of problem approach to get the students engaged. I've got some examples here. Um, design a political system which privileges, privileges certain outcomes. So basically we discuss uh, political systems, how they produce different outcomes and how different arrangements of institutions produce outcomes. And then I have um, um, a whiteboard session where it's got different political institutions, different alternative institutions, and I have a fake um, random outcome generator where it just flashes a, an outcome such as participation or collaboration um, or accountability and, and they have to arrange the institutions um, in order to, to maximise that outcome. Um, another one I have which is quite often fun is, a, is for example a political capital pyramid which pictures of contemporary politicians and the students debate their choices you know as to who they think has got greater or lesser political capital and why. Another one which I haven't done for a long time, it, um, just because of the course contents change, but this used to be fun, was we designed a policy making process um, which enabled the government to, to avoid having to implement a policy or, or a, a fun one as well, which would be able to enable the government to, to hide their accountability. And then you just choose a contemporary, highly contentious political policy debate. So you can see these type of it's a case of rather than um, trying to, to explain to the students how they should be thinking about a, a particular phenomena in the world, we're, we're getting them to kind of think for themselves through presenting them with problems that they've got to resolve. And the idea is we use all of the tools available to us on the online in order to facilitate that. Okay. In a sense, the key, the key thing there is, is identifying in the course material what the possible problems are that students could solve I think I think that's yeah. kind of where you start isn't it and then uh, develop the tutorial from there yeah and I think that, that of course that's always informed by by your learning objectives yeah um, yeah absolutely okay right I think that's the kind of end of the formal PowerPoint -y, uh, session uh, Donna so um, we're happy to take questions. Dave's put a slide there on any questions on activity planning. Uh, this taught me an important lesson about um, uh, planning tutorials online as well, which is that um, don't you, what, what is the software you use, Dave, that causes all the problems? Oh, um, well, it used, well, Linux, it used to be Linux <laughs> I used to use. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I just but, used to drop out, didn't I, of, of online sessions and it take me like 10 minutes to get back in again and, you know, nightmare. So yeah, any questions on activity planning, but any questions on anything really? Um, well, we've got quite a few questions kind of um, lined up, which I can kind of, um, I can run through some of them if that would be, would be useful. Um, but again, if people want to, if people do, we are mostly doing this by the chat box, ironically, but if people do want to kind of use their mics or, you know, and, and, and ask questions, 
please feel feel free to do so. Um, but just to kind of go through a, a couple of um, a couple of questions. Um, there's a question from Anne about how do we make people comfortable um, with a virtual learning environment, especially if people have certain disabilities. Um, again, a, again, a few people have mentioned you know we, we can't we can't kind of read the room, we can't see people's faces, etc. Um, and we also know, particularly at the OU, we have people who might have health problems or um, kind of visual problems etc who might find it um, a bit, bit, bit more tricky to, to, to use certain technology etc so there's quite a, quite a bit to unpack there. That's a really good question and it's something that um, we have particular um, resources that we're, we're lucky enough to have at the Open University and I, I don't know the situation in other universities but essentially um, it boils down to the relationship between the tutor and the student and that can be really important in, in, a, in an online session where it's just the tutor delivering to their own students but often the case is that um, the tutor delivering to students that they've never met before uh, and therefore this idea about students not being able to fully participate or having some barrier to participation is a key one. I mean one of the things we have is, is, is the possibility of contacting the tutor beforehand to make them aware of any particular issues or the tutor particularly being proactive in that uh, and um, identifying what those particular requirements are. I think that's one way of doing it, the kind of a, a ahead of time um, way. Uh, the other thing that was mentioned earlier in some of the feedback that we got from tutors was the idea of sending out resources beforehand so the students are prepared for what they're going to be doing. Um, that's a really good way of helping with that particular issue. Uh, Dave, have you got any, anything yeah, else you'd like to add? I think in many ways online sessions can be beneficial here um so, you know for people who've got well, for example visual impairment it, it can be a lot easier to attend a, an online session than kind of be you know trying to look at a, a whiteboard in a classroom situation and also i found out that exercises which are designed for non-verbal participation can be a lot more inclusive and you know when you're moving things around on a whiteboard for example it, it's anonymous so if you have issues to do with confidence or, or anything like this um, you can do it you can participate without actually you know have, having to stand up if you like which is a lot more inclusive I feel than often in a classroom situation um, but again yeah as Andy says it's absolutely key to, to know your students well beforehand um, and, and to be aware of any disabilities that, that may prevent them from participating fully in the online session I mean, sometimes students may want to make other students aware of the situation that might not be obvious that might be obvious in an online sorry in a face to face situation but might not be obvious in, a in an online scenario that might be helpful to that student so it's, it's about giving I, I think really it's about working with the student and, and negotiating in a sense what 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 would be best for them and hopefully yeah. hopefully the institution has has some clear guidelines or um, about kind of um, what technology should be used um, how students should participate um, maybe also uh, again I know the OU is ahead of the game in many respects um, but students can kind of you know make a make a log of, of, of what their additional requirements are so we're kind of aware ahead of time as to kind of what the situation is so I think again kind of preparation um, is, is key really um, kind of expanding on, on that a little bit in a slightly different angle and um, how about um, any kind of tips and techniques to help with kind of reading the room as it were we can't read people's faces online um it often feels like we're speaking into a, a blank space um kind of how can we kind of check that things are going okay with our students or if they have any questions or problems etc i mean i've got a, a, a quick answer on that one which is that you know building in regular prompts regular kind of questions uh that don't cost the students much to respond to. I think this is one of the, the, the problems, it's something me, me and Dave discussed yesterday when we were talking about preparation for this, which we haven't touched on actually. We thought it would organically come out in the, in the discussion, but it hasn't really. Um, but is allowing students the opportunity to kind of make, well, we talked about cost benefits earlier, but low cost kind of responses, if you like, where, where they're not risking a lot to respond. So it might be a very simple question. It might be kind of uh, something that anybody could answer. <laughs> uh, but that allows somebody to kind of, and, and allows you to then kind of go to that student if, you, if you're particularly concerned about them or you want to give them an opportunity to, to build on something they feel confident in. So I think that's a really good trick, you know, trick is to, is to have low cost kind of opportunities for students to put up their views or ideas and to share them with others. 
I think also touching on something we discussed earlier, I mean, at the EOU, we found it very useful to have two uh, tutors in each session, um, just because it can be very difficult to keep an eye on everything that's going on while you're also trying to use the technology and, and, you know, facilitate the activities. So just someone else there who's watching the chat box, for example, they're taking note of the interactions and um, there's someone left the room, you know, uh, all these, this, this extra support of an additional tutor is really, really helpful. I mean, if you don't have that res res resource, you could ask a, st a student to fulfill that role as well. So you could ask a student to, you know, take it in turns in a different session um, to keep an eye on the chat box and to forward any, you know, key questions to you. And, and that would be a good way of getting students involved anyway. Um, in terms of um, kind of engagement, participation, etc., I had a few comments about um, um, kind of how to kind of encourage uh, encourage um, kind of participation and also to encourage attendance more generally. Um, I guess uh, I know we've had lots of discussions at this about this at the OU um, over the years without coming to any kind of firm conclusion really um, about whether or not we kind of you know mandate participation. Um, you know, do we require it? We build it into to kind of our, our design of, 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 of tuition and assessment. Um, I guess there's kind of pros and cons to that and it might depend partly on, on, on the subject matter, um, any kind of requirements of kind of outside bodies etc. But there is this kind of general discussion I think around you know we can kind of lead a horse to water but we can't make it drink so you know there's only so much we can do to encourage students to participate in tutorials. Is there actually another step that we need to make about actually kind of mandating that in a sense? I mean, in the current context, I, I don't think that's a goer in any respect at the moment, just because of the, the personal situation of lots of people. Um, it's not something that comes up at our institution a lot, I don't think, because the, really the, the, our students, just it's just not possible for them to do that. Um, I think the kind of, one of the reasons students are drawn to, to, to tutorials is, is that they're going to get something out of it. Uh, they're going to get something related to how to approach the assignment. So making sure that, you know, if, that, if that's one of the reasons the students are coming, um, you give them something uh, in response to that. Um, you know, it's a bit like kind of a famous rock band not playing their greatest hits or whatever. You know, you do need to kind of have that built in. What, what do the students expect? But it might be that, you, you know, you ask students what they expect and what they want. I mean, I think that's a fairly, you don't need to do that in every session, but you might do that at the beginning of a, of a, of a, of a term or whatever. And I think, again, we're coming back to learning activities, because, you know, you might be a very charismatic face-to-face uh, -face teacher and, you know, you draw students in because you, you give a really good lecture and a good tutorial, right? But there's a kind of dampening effect, which the online situation kind of does to that. And, you know, you you sound more monotone just by the very nature of the, of the technology and if you're talking and I see it's more tiring as a student if they're not actually in the room it is a lot more tiring to follow an online session as I'm sure you're feeling at the moment and there's you know they've already got a com computer screen open you, you can bet your life that they're going to be online or something like this a large number of them are so I, I feel if you can have engaging activities which are requiring them to actually participate um, they're going to find that more interesting than, than you know, just trying to you know, give them information which they need to absorb. And so I always hope that if I can devise interesting exercises, then the students who, who came last time will want to come again. Or maybe, maybe they'll say on Facebook or something, you know, oh, well, that session was really interesting. Maybe that will draw others in. Um, and I think finding things that relate to, to their experiences as well. So, you know, that relate to the world that they live in. Um, wherever possible. There's been a few questions really about around the subject of um, expecting students to prepare or not for, for tutorials um, and whether or not this is different online compared to face-to-face. -to -face. Um, do we take the same approach or do we need to take a different one to kind of teaching online? I mean Dave's response, well, you know, Dave, Dave's approach uh, and I tend to follow it just from uh, experience is that if you expect too much from students it will be you that falls flat as the, as the tutor. It won't be the students um, because they'll just keep their microphones off or they'll duck out, um, whereas you'll be left holding the baby. So it's kind of, um, I think it's about kind of having that expectation. I think it's, it's nothing wrong with having an expectation that students would be up to the right point in the course. Uh, and you can kind of, 
there are lots of ways you can kind of facilitate that by kind of having questions at the beginning about you know how do people feel about the material that you know fairly informal stuff how are people getting on with this you know have you managed to get up to this bit yet or are you still you know are you still and and people will be quite honest and if, if they can be honest once they can tell you the truth about where they are they'll feel a lot happier happier taking part i think so again i think it's about kind of you know giving the students the opportunity to tell you the truth about where they are um and, and that also provide, helps you provide more support, I think. And I think especially if you're going to be recording it, then the last thing you want is, you know, a, a tutorial which has fallen completely flat on its face and no one's talking because they haven't done the, the preparatory reading. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's my, my personal experience has just been I, I, I assume they've not read anything, but they're, they're open to learning. <laughs> I mean, talk, you know, in, in terms of kind of, um, you mentioned ground rules at one point, uh, kind of, uh, and someone asked, Daniel asked, can you give an example of ground rules in terms yeah. of, you know, the kind of the format of words, etc. Um, obviously, we all work at the OU. Um, we know that students sign up to particular computing codes and kind of uh, conduct codes, etc. Um, is there anything that you found particularly useful in, in relation to kind of setting kind of ground rules before, before an online tutorial? Yeah, so things like kind of, not being derogatory about kind of certain opinions i think is a, is, a, is a particular one so the recognition that there are diverse opinions about politics is really important when you're teaching politics online and people tend to forget this actually you know certain people do uh, and being reminded of that uh, and, and being reminded of the value of opinions that they might find it completely incomprehensible um, is worthwhile <laughs> But yeah, we have a computing code of conduct, which is really helpful because it sort of sets the kind of, and, and it's very reasonable. Dave, you probably know it better than I do. Um, I, I don't know. Can you remember that. any of the particular gems in it? But it, but, it, but it kind of just allows students to sort of recognize, okay, but actually the, the, the function of, of ground rules really isn't necessarily in the content of the ground rules. It's more about the students just being made aware that, you know, the way they treat each other is important. I mean, it can be helpful just to have a, sli a first slide up, you know, um, just reminding everyone to be polite and respectful of each other you know, just outlining some general key points about the ground rules um the norms that you want to have during your session i should have bought my slide that i've got um i can't remember what's on it right now. <laughs> but it's, fa it's it's fairly basic stuff you know about you know respecting other people's opinions etc i think it's about it's about kind of setting people's expectations isn't it it's about, and, and kind of being clear from the start in the same way you want to be clear about what the, the content of the tutorial is going to be and what's expected of people it's about making it clear kind of how they're expected to behave um in the actual um session itself so i think the two things kind of go hand in hand um in in some respects i think we've got time for for, for one more question um and i'll just kind of leave it on a, on, a, on a kind of practical note um in relation to kind of dave's um example um lee asks about your work example how does it work when people are moving the boxes around if you've got lots of people all kind of working together um is there any kind of any more explanation you, you can give on that um yeah i mean you 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 have to kind of facilitate that process uh, you always get tug of war um and and then you can just use that as an opportunity to to discuss that particular element. You can move it around yourself. You can take control. Of, well, at least on the whiteboard setup that we have, you you can take control over that. Um, but yeah, I always use that as, as a point. Of, I can say, oh, hang on, I can see there's a the disagreement over this this block here. I can, let, let's explore this particular idea or something like that. You can use it as a point of, of discussion, and I find it really useful. Um, when you can you can use that as a, as a jumping off point to discuss the contestability of a particular idea or something like that. Um, I mean, if people are just struggling over the box and nothing's written on there, you can just just move it away, and you know, that's that's going to happen to some extent. But but you know, your role is there to facilitate. Um, I I can't say I've had any real major problems, um, and it's it's been a very productive experience. Well, I think we probably don't have time for any more questions at the moment but just to say that you know we we, we do kind of tweet online um via our kind of twitter accounts so if anyone has any questions that hasn't been answered please do post them online and we'll try and answer them um on twitter instead um i just want to say thank you very much um andy and dave for coming for such a great session it's great to see so many people here particularly at such a um a busy time with all the kind of clearing chaos going on the session has been recorded and it will appear on our website shortly 
and we'll also send you a feedback email as well. We are planning some more sessions in the autumn about more general teaching and learning matters, not online learning, you may be glad to hear. So is there anything you, you want to you think it should be covered or indeed if you want to run a session um, please do get in touch and also um, if you have attended at least three sessions you can get a certificate of participation so please email PSA or BISA. So I just want to say again thank you for coming and thank you to Andy and Dave for running the session and hopefully we'll see you in the autumn. Thank you everybody. Thank you.